giving God the glory worldwide. You're watching the Gospel America Network. I grew up with Sunday Christians. I grew up with the with the deacon at the liquor store on Friday, and then on Sunday he's doing tithes and offerings. So when I grew up, that's all I knew was that you had to live a double life in order to really live this. And when I started living this with my family, people told me it don't take all that. It don't take all. That. You don't need to be holy. You don't need to speak encouragement to your wife. You don't rebuke things out of your life. You, there's no need to live in this way because there's nobody doing it. Ain't nobody doing it. I hate to say it like this, but sometimes the biggest problem with Christianity are, are Christians. Come on, Deacon. I got to put it right there. Shark, you know how I talk. I put it right there for you. So we've done all these things, and we think we can live every sort of way Monday through Friday, but then get up in and something's supposed to come out of you? Something's supposed to be able to edify my sister? Something's going to be able to edify elder? No, no, no. That, that's, not, that's not how it works. We're holy. Once you know that you were bought with a price, my God, you were bought with a price. Now, let, let me just back this up because it, it gets so, so run down so many times. When, I'm, when I buy something at a price, let's say I buy a pair of shades. Kelsey, we always talking about shades. I got a pair of gas station shades that I paid like $3 for. They do the same thing. They probably look as good. But my gas station shades, I don't really worry too much when I lose those or step on those or lose those on the boat. It doesn't really matter because they only cost $3. But Mills, Mills, when I get me a pair of Ray-Ban shades, I'm going to take a, a little bit better care of those. Don't, Carl, don't talk because I, I lose those too. But what I'm saying is you, I understand the value of those shades. I, un, I treat them differently because I know what, the, what, I, what I paid for them. So if I can do that with shades, we do it with shoes, we do it with anything you want. Man, you get a fresh haircut that costs you $40, Mills, because he's a pretty boy, so i got to keep coming at him. When you get a fresh hair, you want everybody to see that cut. You don't want nobody to see the cut your daddy used to give you, you know, when your edge of line going crazy. You don't want nobody to see that, right? So when are we going to take that same attitude towards our, towards our bodies, towards the, the temple of the living God? Because I know if I was paid with a price, I want to be on Front Street. I want, to, I want everyone to see how good God is. And I'm already loud, so it's really not that hard for them to hear me, but I want them to see me. I want them to see me. And the song said, I want you to open the eyes of your heart and see me. I don't want you to see me for Michael Black. I want you to see me as a child of God because I'm a temple of the living God. So when you recognize that you were, you were bought with a price, you understand that you're a, a temple to the living God. Now let's break down what is the temple. And all of you ministers and elders, we're not going to go through the entire thing. Because I don't think, I don't believe in being up here all day. Because we know that gets... That gets a little, a little fun. So we're going to hear some very, just three key points. I'm not going to sit up here and waste your time. I don't have enough stuff, and y'all don't want to listen that long. So it's fine. So whenever we think about the temple, in the back in the Jewish days, this was something that the, they would come, they would sing, they would praise, and they would glorify God. This is what they came to the temple for. So for God to say that we are the temple, it means that we must magnify Him. It doesn't mean I am not a singer. If you guys didn't hear 15 minutes ago, I can't sing. But I have no, it's my duty to glorify God no matter what I have because this is a temple. And if this is what he wants me to do, then I'm going to go sing. I, don't, I sing in my car. I sing in the shower. I sing at 530 in the morning and I'm getting ready for PT. You see, I said 530 PT started like 515. But uh, I sing. That's, I, I, I want to glorify God. I want to uplift him. And some, one lady saw me in my car singing and she wrote on the window and said, right on. I said, okay. How you say it, Elder? Praise, 
Praise be to God. Praise be to God. Keep it moving. So just as the temple was devoted to God, your body should be devoted to God. And your body should be a place where, where he is worshipped. But how do we worship God today? A lot of times in scripture it says standing, kneeling, whatever the case may be. But the most important thing, and Sharky, you got your notes out. But this is something that you want to write down. The most important thing is to offer our bodies to God as a living sacrifice. Living sacrifice. Living sacrifice. What you would call it, Mills likes to use big words, so this is an oxymoron. This doesn't even, you can't be a living sacrifice because a sacrifice has to be dead. But God said, let me show you how bad I am. Let me show you how strong I am. I need you to be a living sacrifice. That means there's going to be some, some death. This is the supreme act of worship. This is where it starts. Because if you ain't dying to nothing and you say that you're a Christian, I really, I really question your walk. If you're doing everything you wanted to do and you say you're a Christian, I got to question your walk. I got to question, Elder. I gotta, you got you to gotta come in front of the church. Tell me what you're doing. Because I want to know how I can live, get all this stuff, and still be not dying to anything. So back in the old days, the sacrifice was actually, you brought, you know, chicken, duck, I don't know. I'm just naming she you you name it. You might have you might even bought some yams. I don't know. You bought some, you bought stuff to the altar. Because that was your way uh, of sacrificing. Oh. Uh, thank you, princess. So now what we're seeing is God says, uh, because you can bring it's easy for Mills to go out there and kill a pig and then bring it here and says, Hey, I'm healed. I did it, I killed it. No, Mills, you just brought some bacon to the altar. That's all you really did. But God said, because you can give that to me with a simple heart. You, you can't, when you give me a living sacrifice, you can't give this with a, a simple heart. It's an act of submission when you're get, being a living sacrifice. And we are living sacrifice. So that's why in Samuel 15, 22, he says, to obey is better than sacrifice. To obey, if you obey my word, day in and day out. That's way better than you giving me some type of burnt offering because that really doesn't do much. It doesn't change your heart. It just shows that you can hunt. We don't want some hunters. We want some people that are submitting to, to the word of God. Every, you get Everyone getting it? Everyone getting it? If I'm going too fast, just go like this. Slow down, man. I got it right. Slow down, man. I didn't get that point. I, it don't matter, man. It's my first time doing it, so we just going to roll with the punches. Amen? So, secondly, ah, uh, Secondly, everybody has military service in this house. So you real, when I say this word, a little tingle may shoot up your spine. Secondly, duty, duty, duty. Duty is the most sublimest word in the English language. We all, we all know that. Duty. It tells us that the temple was a place where men and women, where they completed their duties. You have a duty. Ron, you have a duty to be a husband. Elder Goshe, you have a duty to minister the word. You have a duty. Brady, you have a duty to lead your family. These are things that we must do. These are things. So duty, when you really break it down, the root meaning is to owe. It means to what is due. So if it's our duty in the temple, I know when I go to work, I owe at a very, very high level. I owe something to the taxpayers. I know that's my duty. I have to be a good steward of the taxpayer's dollar. When you go to work, you owe something to your boss. When you, that's your duty as an employee. You owe something to the coach when you step on the field. But who do we owe for this? Uh, taxpayers ain't gave me this. Um, the coach ain't gave me this because I sat on the bench. So who gave me this? So when you really got to think about who gave you your life, it's a duty. It's, it, in the temple, it's a duty to serve him. It's always going to be a duty, but to really magnify this word, you've got to think, what is the opposite of duty? What if no one had duties? What if I came home and said, well, Carl, today I don't feel like being your husband. I'm going to go be one of, a bar hopper. That probably would, wouldn't work out because I have no duties at the house. So when we think of what is the opposite of duty, you got self-centeredness. You have rebellion, chaos, anarchy. The, all the Christian code of conduct is for gr a growth process. If you got no duties, you're not growing. There's no way. So when, when we really think about this, I, I got to, you know, uh, Sharky, uh, Bill, Khalil, Cheyenne, and uh, you. Come here. Come here. And Mills. Come on to the front. Come on. Come on. Come on. Brayden, you too. You too. Oh, yeah. Come on. Could, could, could not dodge the bullet because I told you. I, I, 
interactive church. Look at all these well-dressed people. Can we get a hand clap for them? Oh my gosh. How do I have such beautiful friends? I don't know. So let's get in a, we're going to get like a huddle formation. Y'all know what a huddle is? I'm going to try to huddle up, huddle up, huddle up, huddle up. <laughs> hand, hand over the shoulder, straight huddling up. So when, when you ask how does this relate back to the, to the Christian walk, how does duty fall in? This is what, this is what duty looks like. It, it doesn't look like uh, any, what you're seeing. Duty looks like it is my job because you don't know who's strong in this huddle. You don't know who's weak in this huddle. You don't know who believes in this huddle. You don't know who doesn't believe in this huddle. But it's our job. It's my duty to uplift him because Jesus came for the sick, not the healed. So my duty is to lift my brother up. So when God says, all right, you're going to run a cover three, you're going to run this. When God gives the play, it's your duty to execute it. It's not your job to say, well, God, he don't believe. Oh, well, God, well, he curse. Oh, well, he drink. It, it, it don't matter because this is what duty looks like. Everybody in this huddle is different. Everybody is different. Oh, I had one guy tell me, oh, well, you got any church in San Angelo? Well, yeah. Oh, is that a black church or a white church? What? Well, what? what? No, this, this is the church from these 66 books. I don't really know what church you're looking for. But your duty doesn't, doesn't limit, you, limit you to their walk, their color, their national origin, their age. It doesn't matter. This is duty. So, so when, we really, when we really put it into context, this is what it is. God calling the plate from the middle. And we say, ready, break. So I want, the t can the huddle say, can the huddle please say, I owe it to you. I owe it to you. Because it was given to me. Because it was given to me. Say, I owe it to you. I owe it to you. Because it was given to me. Now look at somebody in the huddle and say, and church join in. I owe it to you. I owe it to you. Because it was given to me. And that, that's duty. Give the huddle a round of applause. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That, that, that's what it looks like when you're really holding somebody else. It doesn't mean like, well, well you know, he's different. He, he's different, right? No, no. When you're, when you're doing your duty, it looks like something. When you're doing your duty, the world around you may not look like what a religious person would agree with. But, Elder, you can completely agree with me that sometimes you got to get your, get your hands dirty. Because that's what, that's what Jesus is about. I've never, I never heard, you know, I never heard of Jesus putting up a sign saying, you know, I hate fags. Oh, wow. I, I, ne let's be honest, I never heard of Jesus saying that, you know, that one race is better than another. I've never heard of Jesus saying that. And I got to hit it right here, Sharky, because this angers me. That huddle is how I see my walk. If I'm not lifting somebody up, then what am I doing? What, what, what am, why am I here? Why am I here? Why do, why, I can go play golf. Sharky, you know, I'm not that good at it, but we can go do it. Why, why, why are we here day in, day out? Why do we keep bringing our sin to the altar? Why do we keep dying to things every day? Why do we say no to things that feel good and say yes to things that feel bad? And I don't understand why we're doing it if I don't have a sense of duty, if I don't have a sense of, of unction about myself. Think about it. So as you're walking this thing and, and thinking you don't have something, you already got to die to yourself. You got to be a living sacrifice and you got to be a a place of duty where you can get your work done just like your nine to five you can't check when you check into your body it's 24 7 you can't check out you don't get overtime for this this is this is your god says it's your reasonable sacrifice this is your re, living all this holy is is reasonable it's not even anything extra that you're doing so lastly i'm gonna be here long i feel like i'm hitting the points you getting it i don't need to be here for a long time i can if y'all want me to okay thank you this, your temple, this has to be a place for flipping. Flipping, flipping. Say flipping. flipping. Say whipping. It got to be a place for flipping and whipping. What? Elder said, oh, we're talking flipping and whipping. Elder, you know, you know come on. I, I'm going to bring it back. I'm going I'm to bring it back. I'm gonna, so John 2.15 tells us that Jesus made a whip from some ropes. A whip from some rope. Y'all thought the Django was the first person to, to whip somebody on in, in public. No, this, this Jesus made a whip from some ropes. You hear that, Khalil? This don't look like that save that's on the on the wall everywhere I go. It looks so nice and I'm like, man, he has good hair. I don't have any hair, but I want hair like him if I did have hair. And he chased them out of the temple. He drove them out the sheep and cattle, scattered the money changers, coins all over the floor, and he turned over the tables. He turned over the tables. Now, I could imagine Jesus coming, a carpenter, 
oh, you know, dirty. He walk into the city and he sees you're doing what? So what was happening was they were changing. In order to give the money that the, that the church needed in, in this uh, in this area, you had to actually exchange rate. It's like I'm going to Canada and Church of Canada. Hey, I need some Canadian can coins. What's Canadian coins called? Nobody knows. Good. I'm not, not by myself. So I need some Canadian coins. Take them in, change them. But hey, I'm gonna charge you a fee. I'm gonna charge you about three dollars just just for the change, man. You know, I, you know, I got man. I'm gonna charge you three dollars. That's it. So Vince got to the point. Hey, give, also give sacrifices. Give sac. Hey, I, I give a gave a specific sacrifice, and I'm going. On real fast because this isn't my main point but they started bringing in all sorts of mess into God's house say mess, mess. how many y'all got some mess in your life be honest be honest I got some mess in my life goodness I love you princess I got some mess in my life but what God did when he went in there he started whipping and flipping and I don't even know ripping because I'm pretty sure it rhymes but no but he started whipping and flipping that's what he did see now I got this back. Now that you know how bad, how awesome, how strong, because we ain't serving a little weak God. Imagine me coming in here and whipping people and sending them out and flipping over tables. Y'all would think I was crazy. I'd probably have a cutoff shirt, you know, just doing, I might as well add to the, to the appearance that I have. But how many people are going to let Jesus be a whipping and flipping Jesus in their temple? How many things you going to let get whipped out of your life and flipped out of your life. How many people are going to allow this type? Because everybody wants love is patience, love is kind. That, that's nice, but when you're trying to get saved and you're trying to live something for your marriage, you got to let some stuff get whipped out of your life. You got to let some stuff get flipped out of your life. See, you got to say, Jesus, let this relationship get flipped out of my life. Lord, let this, let this adulterous spirit get whipped out of my life. Let these words that come out of my mouth, let them get flipped into words that will glorify you. So whipping and flipping, this is something that you're demanded to do. He did it. I'm not making this stuff up. He's so bad, but you got to go to his, Lord, I can't do it with this person on my arm. I can't, I can't do it with this relationship in my life. And sometimes, because if anybody ever been whipped or flipped, it ain't easy. It, it's going to hurt. You're going to feel it. And it's going to feel it. But that's, that's what it's about. If something coming out of your life doesn't hurt, it probably wasn't worth nothing. God said, I, I want you to feel some, some pain with this one. So when you letting things get whipped in and flipped out of your life, you, it, it's not, Jesus didn't go in the temple and said, excuse me, excuse me, I'm lying. Can you please exit to the right? Thank you all. You're a sweetheart. You're a sweetheart. No, no, no. Well, uh, adultery? Hey, hey, get out of here, guy. Get out of here, crazy adultery. What's going on? Hey, uh, uh, cheating. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, all of these, a multitude of sins, because no sin is greater than the other. Hey, can you please exit to the right? No, no. This is an open temple. You are opening yourself up to God, and you got to allow him to go in there and kick some stuff out, because i got to believe that when Jesus, kicked, when Jesus kicked it out, excuse me, because, you know, I've been a horse, but uh, when Jesus kicks the stuff out, it didn't come back. I don't think that cattle said, well, Jesus is gone. No, that cattle is probably like, man, I got the whipping of my life. I ain't going back in that temple. The money changed said, oh, screw it. This man is plumb crazy. And then he looked at him and told, tear it all down. I rebuilt it. Man, this man done lost his mind. But that's what happens when Jesus whips stuff out of your life. That's what happens when Jesus flips out of your life. This can't be done by your best friend on Facebook. Your mama can't whip and flip stuff out your life. Your friends can't whip and flip stuff out your life. Buddha can't whip and flip stuff out your life. Allah can't whip and flip stuff out of your life. Only Jesus can whip and flip stuff out of your life. It never comes back. It doesn't come back. That, that, that's what they're telling you here in this passage. Because we all know that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They are mighty, mighty, mighty. God's so bad, whenever I finish doing what I'm doing, once I finish whipping, flipping, dipping, and slipping, everything out your life, all you got to do is stand. Giving God the glory worldwide. You're watching the Gospel America Network.